What's up guys, Earl at Sumo Bully Kennels back at you with another one. Uh, so, in this episode tonight, we're getting back into our series of Are You Thinking About Getting Into Dog Breeding, right? And so we've been through a couple episodes already, but in this one, I actually want to go into detail because you guys requested it in terms of the numbers and what our projections are. And what does it cost to actually um, either purchase a an adult male or a puppy? So we'll go through those numbers and to see if it makes sense. But before that, I uh, want to start by saying thank you so much for all you guys who have subscribed, liked, and shared our content. Uh, big shouts out to everyone who is continually supporting our, our channel. Uh, for those of you who watch and have not yet subscribed, uh, do us a favor, please like and subscribe. It means a lot to us and it, it certainly helps support the cause, right? Um, notable mentions, uh, because of a high volume of requests from you guys messaging me, um, we will be making some pretty cool announcements in the next couple of episodes. So stay tuned for that. Um, other than that, let's get into this one here. So, uh, as a aspiring breeder who loves the breed, um, loves the bullies, particularly for us in XL Lane, you know, it's important to understand the financial um, demands and um, responsibilities that come with starting a program, right? Because to pursue our passion certainly requires an investment a holding cost and uh, at least a break-even point if not a profit right because nothing is more enjoyable than doing something you love and reaping a reward such as compensation or financial benefit right so this is why I go over these things so without further ado um, I don't want to rant or ramble let's get into this uh, episode starting your breeding program with a male uh, the pros and cons of it in which um, we're going to explore both sides to see how much sense it actually makes to bring in a uh, high-value, high-powered male into your program, what those costs are, and uh, generally what to expect, right? So I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm expanding. Pardon me, I'm still learning how to work this. Okay, so... You know what before we get into the classroom uh, let's look at some notable dogs that are high value dogs um, in our lane for the XLs so this is uh, Jumanji bossy Jumanji here and if you look at that uh, his stud fee is twenty thousand dollars right and uh, I think it's a justified cost for the value of the dog, what he produces, the lineage that he comes from, how many generations it took to create an um, absolutely amazing dog that produces his butt off. Um, so yeah, I don't think he's overpriced, to be honest. Um, here, another notables for us is Mr. Klaus of Kennel Rocha, imported by Samba Kennels. Um, Aurea, a friend of mine. Uh, I'm a big fan of this boy. I believe he brings a lot of substance, right? So he's kind of like that stud that in the XL lane that has kind of like that pocket look, right? For a big boy, you know, typically when we start hitting those big boys, they're leggy and stuff like that, but that's not the case with him. So I'm a big fan of him. And uh, I look forward to his future uh, productions as they grow up and uh, really show what he can uh, contribute to our breed, uh, especially paired with the right female. There he is, handsome as can be. Uh, one of the dogs I put hands on. Uh, absolutely stunning and amazing. I'm a big fan of his uh, and continue to be. Next one. Look at this guy. Morpheus of MBK, Monster Bully Kennels. Um, 
I would I aspire to visit them one day I know uh, they're a very busy camp and uh, I still would like to see their setups their yard and everything else like that so if you look here his koi is nine you know DNA cleared uh, stud fee to approve females is thirty thousand um, dollars how do I feel about that price well I think uh, based on their business model and how they operate um, I would say in the marketplace for what they do they really don't need to stud him out um, they can keep them in house and work with them so for their business model I think that number makes sense but uh, certainly a big damn dog when it comes to American XL bullies right and again he's he's um, I'll show you a better picture but yeah he, he's nice he's a low boy thick nice coloring on him and uh, beautiful head beautiful face beautiful markings <coughs> here he is mr. Morpheus himself looking very nice nice structure um, in the in terms of type yeah he definitely fits in the the type of dogs I like like him Klaus Jumanji you know uh, not so tall of dogs 22 or under but definitely exhibit a lot of the breed type um, you can see the different coats next up we have uh, mr. smash with Kate from the Eternals um, this is one of the dogs that I've seen in person uh, amazing dog and there's his stud fee and that actually is a very fair price to be honest um, people should be jumping all over that if you're into breeding it's a very good price for a very well-bred dog with good pedigree, good lineage, uh, good colorings, correct. Uh, I had a chance to spend time with this boy for a few hours, and uh, he really doesn't have a bad angle, to be honest. Um, very nice chest on him, nice shoulders. Exceptional like this. These pictures don't show his rear, but he's got a great rear. Just a beautiful, beautiful boy. Um, so these are um, notable mentions, and I don't want to keep going down. You know, I could pick up at least another 10 dogs that I'm a huge fan of. And even though I don't have them on picture on screen, uh, I like, you know, certain. I, I love Zippo. I love Loso. I love Top Gun. I love uh, Emmanuel Tavares' new dog, uh, Johnny Bones. Johnny Bones. Johnny Bones. My goodness. So a uh, lot of amazing, beautiful dogs out there. And just because I didn't name them does not mean they're not amazing. Um, just wanted to show you um, in the XLs, there are dogs, right? Because people often say like XLs are leggy. They, they lose the breed type. But there are a lot of amazing males and females out there. But today's episode is centered around the males. So without further ado, guys... Um, you guys like this part so let's get into the boring part <laughs> so bear with me there's a nice picture of smashy there um, and uh, he um, recently had some uh, photo ops in the snow which is pretty cool actually so um, looking forward to uh, his photo op I've seen some of it already amazing shots out to Cade shots out to uh, Areo with some kennels uh, Shouts out to MBK. Shouts out to Bossy Kennels for having amazing dogs that, as a breeder, as a fan, that I can see, aspire, and absolutely um, geek out over, right? Let's see here. Okay, so back to our episode. Um, you know, I, I took the four easy ones that we can get where you can see the pricing online. So let me minimize this and get into it. Okay, well, happy Thursday. Let's get into it. I was in the mood today. Um, what does it cost to get into it as a breeder going the mail route? There are some crazy, crazy productions out there. Uh, one of them that I'm a fan of is uh, Madhouse XL Bullies production with Smash and Lavish. That's going to be a killer one. Um, also, uh, one I've been watching closely is uh, Jose Miranda's uh, double line bre breeding with uh, Rhino, Saurus, and Godiva. That's a good one for me, too, because I follow certain bloodlines that I like. 
and the, those bloodlines are pretty consistent for me and for our program the blood we have on the yard it's very easy to use mix and match to have that consistency and not expect any uh, surprises right so here we go without further ado let's say you started with a puppy from a killer breeding that you're a fan of right and we're going to put that cost of buying that puppy at 5000 which honestly is probably like a third or fourth pick, if not lower. You're talking about a killer breeding. You're going to pay 8 10 12 15 If it's a super killer breeding, even more um, to get the first pick, which typically is reserved for the breeder, right? So let's cover that real quick before I continue. So typically when breeders breed... Um, they are trying to achieve a goal and typically their first picks are reserved for in-house for them to keep their production to continue and perpetuate their breeding so when you're trying to buy someone's first pick you're really trying to take a piece of what they work so hard to create to incorporate into their program so therefore, you know, there are going to be nuances with buying somebody's first pick. Um, one, that's going to come at a higher price. Two, that probably will include some kind of uh, uh, a stud credit, like two or three, which will not be sold but will be used in-house. And three, um, if it's not a co-owned, right, just a straight out outright purchase, um, it, it's really hard to let go of that. So without further ado, just giving you the value of a first pick male, right? Uh, puppy charges can be ranged 5 to 20 grand, let's just say. Just put it at 5 to be conservative. Shots, 1000 on the first year, everything. Um, crop, 600 bucks is the medium price. Uh, some people can get it for less, some people pay more. Housing and toys, cool chains, outfits, all the stuff we like to buy for dogs, 500 bucks, which is a low budget because they'll probably tear up two or three beds. <laughs> uh, food, utilities, and everything else. Uh, I got that at 2400 200 bucks a month, which includes the uh, feeding. Uh, best feed you can give raw, whether you make it or you buy it. Uh, the best uh, supplements that you can give your dog because uh, you're investing in this male as a stud. So whether, you know, whichever vitamin company you like, and we use New Vet Plus and New Joint Plus. And actually, if you look in our description below, you will see our discount code. But that's what we use. That's what we like, uh, you know, to each their own. So that's $2,400 to me is a reasonable uh, it's not inflated and it's not cheaping out on your puppy, right? To get the best nutrition. DNA health tests. I'm talking about something like Embark, right? Uh, for genetic health testing or any kind of issues that the dog may or may not have, may or may not carry, that can be perpetuated. Um, registration, typically $50. And I'm talking about ABKC or, you know, a similar uh, registration our dogs are with a ABKC so dog transport uh, let's say that dog is in the US you're gonna pay roughly 750 on average and that's ground transport and uh, if you would really want to get into the detail into this number uh, check out our uh, episode on should you pick up your dog or pay a transporter um, we did an international transport which is 4,000 plus another 1200 bucks um, for local because I picked her up because I wanted to and that was just me you know wanting to do it myself so grand total for year one of holding this dog is 10,450 now the nice thing is after year one you could open them up for early stud credits I would wait a year to see how the dog develops and in the XL lane you start off with a puppy that's 15 to 20 pounds eight months later you got a 100 pound plus dog uh we got our baby kaiju i think he was like 18 pounds at eight weeks uh right now he's like he just turned eight months five days ago 
and he's probably 112 pounds. His last weigh-in was like 105 or something ridiculous. But uh, they grow fast. They grow unproportional. Do not freak out. Sometimes the front end grows faster. Sometimes the legs grow faster. And you're like, what did I just purchase? Did I just buy a giraffe, right? But uh, be patient. Um, they say trust the blood because the reality is the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, right? That, that boy is going to pick up from the mom or the dad. And as long as you've seen the mom or the dad and you research the bloodline, you kind of know what you're going to expect. So in that first 12, 15, 18 months, if you're feeding the dog correctly and giving them the proper supplementation, which in our case, XL Bullies, uh, feeding right, uh, giving the right nutrition, the right vitamins, the right bone and joint support, then when the dog's uh, structure sets, that's when you're going to see what the dog for what it's worth. Uh, meanwhile, the, all the in-between stages and the awkward lanky stages, do not freak out. Um, if you did your research, you'll be fine. So, uh, anyhow, um, that's year one cost. Now, you can start studying them out, right? So, between year two to three, year one and two and two to three, uh, shots are going to be 500 bucks. That's two years worth, 250 a year. And your food's going to be 4800 right? Food and vitamins and everything else. Heating, air conditioning, every all the comforts that we provide our dog to make sure that the dog is given everything it needs to develop the way we want it to. So year two total, year one to two, two to three, here it is. All right, which is incorrect. One second, my math is incorrect. Let me fix that for you guys. Hold on. Spreadsheet did not update. I'm a spreadsheet guy. I don't know how I missed that. So roughly $5,300, right? Um, let's combine that with the intangible cost. Which I think... You know what? I'll cover that first. So uh, year one, 10450 uh, Year two and year three, 5300 Right? Uh, intangible cost is going to be these following items, which I've gone through many times. So I'm just going to kind of whiz through them. Marketing, research and development, uh, daily care, feed, poo, pickup, medical, uh, emergency medical reserve, dog care, when you go on vacation, photos and videos, setting up your business, right? Your stud fee contracts, things like that. That stuff requires time, right? Uh, social media, putting that dog out there so everyone knows he's out there and available. Communication, at least two hours a week of responding to people who have interest. Networking. So all these things that I've been through in other episodes, which again, I don't want to detail out because I've been through it so many times. Here's the associated in this column, associated hours, multiplied by $20 and the time frame of a year, giving you your cost per line item here. So your yellow total here is what it would cost in a year if you had a full-time person that you paid $20 an hour to take care of all these hours to make sure all these things get done. And that uh, time value equates to $31,500, right? Oftentimes, we discount the time value part of it. And let me just explain. Um, if I was not doing all these things for my dog, I could drive Uber and make 20, 25 bucks an hour, right? Or deliver pizzas. You know, in an hour, I could probably deliver three, four pizzas and get tips and make 20, 30, 40 dollars an hour. So we are conservatively putting 20 dollars an hour to get this total in a year's time. So expense of year one, buying the dog, and year two and year three. Uh, total with intangible cost, you're looking at $47,250, right? So before we get into revenue, let's understand what are expenses. What does it cost? So for three years, it costs you $47,250 to have this dog. 
That's buying the dog, the care, the shots, everything. Pardon me, my dog's barking in the background. I, apparently they're awake at 10.35 at night. So, uh, okay. Before we get into money and what you can make, um, typically everyone jumps into what they can make and not understand what it costs them. So, with that said, expense for year one for an adult. Adult male purchase. You want to buy a solid adult male dog with deep pedigrees that is showing the phenotype and carries the genotype and everything else clean, correct, all that good stuff that you like. Well, guess what? You're probably going to pay around $30,000 for this male. And this male is probably going to be 10 to 12 months old. Just right about the time where he can start studying up. And I've looked at males and I've, uh, you know, played with this thought. So we'll go down expenses, registration, same thing, shot, same thing, housing and toys, food and utilities, DNA health test, dog transport. It's all the same cost, but this time you're dealing with a dog that's 10, 12, maybe even 18 months or two years. So the total cost to acquire this dog in the first year right is uh thirty four thousand one hundred dollars well that's not even right jeez well, i am off tonight guys this spread I, I shifted some cells and for some reason it um stopped calculating on me sorry yeah no thirty four thousand oh that's right okay i'm sorry thirty four thousand one hundred uh so if we add the intangible cost i just we just went over um Year one of having that dog is $65,600, right? But again, getting this dog at 12 months or older, you're pretty much ready to go, right? However, no one knows you have this dog unless you put in these intangible costs of marketing, sales, and everything else. So, whew, let's just take a breather right there. Uh, all right, so... Year one to year three to acquire a puppy, you're at forty-seven thousand dollars, which is obviously less than the sixty-five thousand. Um, to get an adult dog that's at least a year old, um, in out the gate, the first twelve months, you're sixty-five thousand six hundred. The difference is with a puppy, you gotta wait twelve months, and purchasing an adult male, pretty much the minute you can put them out there, and um, make them available to the public he can produce for you day one the minute you get him there and that he's health tested and everything else okay break over let's continue let's start with the puppy year one year one to three so you're gonna get year one okay that's out the way so from 12 months to 24, from 24 to 36, this is, I'm going to go over a 24 month period or two years, right? Uh, early lock-ins for this dog. Let's say you're going to introduce him in at three early lock-ins, which is very common in the industry at 5,000, right? Um, your first tier stud fee. If the dog is what he's supposed to be, uh, you can take him to show. Uh, so people can put hands on him, see what he is, see the value of him. Um, obviously, you're going to put your time in marketing to show the pedigree of the dog and everything else. So after your three early lock-ins, you're going to bump him up maybe to 7,500, right? Um, and let's say you sell three of those. Now, after that, you've been to a few shows. You're showing him. Uh, he's start, you know people are starting to like his productions. These dogs are, you know, six, eight, ten months old now, and they're starting to see like, wow, he's really throwing his look or improving someone's yard, and you sell another four, right? These four stud fees at, let's say, 9000 So, uh, total sales, 73000 This is in the 24-month period. So, when you got at your tw uh, month 12, you sold three early lock-ins. 
took a little break, bumped them up, you know, campaigned them a little bit, took them around the block to, so that people can see what you're excited about. You sold another three at 75. Um, you know, now his productions are starting to get old and people are trying to see, like, oh, he's really throwing. And he started, you know, do well and garner the attention. Uh, people are starting to warm up to him. Uh, and then you sell another four. So now we're talking about a 24-month period, right? And you sold uh, 10 stud fees, which is reasonable in a 24-month period. Total sales of $73,500, less your expenses, which we determined right here is $47,250. Your gross profit is $26,250. Now, it doesn't stop there, right? Because let's say you're a breeder and you have three or four females hanging around that you could take this boy to. And you use them four times. Um, we're going to conservatively uh, use the first tier stud fee at 7500 right? Times four it gives you $30,000. Right, so not only did you make twenty six thousand two hundred fifty dollars on this boy, but you were also able to use him in house and um, save yourself thirty thousand dollars in stud fees. So, in essence, his positive contribution to your yard is fifty six thousand two hundred and fifty dollars in three years. Right. Does that make sense? I hope it does, because I really was trying to show this uh, correctly. And uh, that's not bad, right? Uh, now, let's go over the cons of starting with a puppy. The cons are he may not turn out the way you want him to, right? So what you think he is versus what he may or may not be when he gets older are two different things. So, understand this, guys. Just because you pick the first pick puppy does not guarantee you that he'll turn out exactly the way you want, right? Oftentimes, we have this misconception that a first pick pup is going to be clean, correct, wide, boned up, all this, everything, um, and exhibit what the pedigree says he should be what his parents are showing to be which to be honest 90 percent of the time it, it will and that's why we buy a first pick because the first pick male is the best representation and exhibits the phenotype that we like and carries the genotype that we like if it was not true then why does every breeder price their males right let's say four males as first second third fourth because at six to eight weeks they show us a snapshot of what they're going to be and the reality is if you understand what you're looking at you're going to know which one to pick to benefit your program and also to um, manage his breeding career so that he could be an asset on your yard so uh, with that said even with all that said, you're not guaranteed, right? That's, But that's life. You're not guaranteed anything in life. So let me be clear about that. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to be honest, right? Okay, moving right along. So right there, guys, if you started from ground zero with a male and started studying him out at 12 months, his potential value on, you know, as a stud and for your yard is right around $56,250 inside of 36 months. And this is properly managing his career. And it's very reasonable to sell 10 stud fees over 24 months. Absolutely very reasonable. Not including what you're going to use them for in your yard, right? Okay, moving right along. Now. This is the projected sales for an adult that's one year old, right? We're going to stick with the same pricing. Early lock-ins, three at five, right? 
Uh, first year stud fee, three at seventy five hundred. At this point, those early productions should be a year, maybe a little bit older, and you sell four at nine. So the total is the same, seventy three thousand five hundred dollars in gross sales, right? Your total expense is a little bit higher, um, just because. Uh, you have less holding costs, but you also paid more for him up front, right? So let me go, let me scroll up. Uh, this when you buy this dog, he's ready to go, but you also paid twenty five thousand dollars more than you did for that puppy, and you didn't sit on him for a year. I'm talking about the minute you get you get him, he's he's good to go, All right? He's got the phenotype, the genotype. He just doesn't have productions yet. And therefore, you're going to have to come in with that early lock and fee for someone who believes in his productions and stuff like that. So, um, okay, so your total expenses, uh, $65,600. Your gross profit being $7,900, right? And then again, we'll get back to the benefits of using him. So if you buy a high power male and you have a couple of females or three or four females and you use them four times, that intangible value is $30,000 plus your gross profit off studying him in the first uh, 24 months that you had him, you're looking at a total of $37,900 or roughly $38,000, right? So compared to uh, a ground roots, so you're talking about 38,000 versus 56,000. The difference is you had to wait a year on that puppy. And you didn't know what he was going to look like when he got bigger. So there's kind of like the risk of reward, right? You spent more money to get this boy, but you he's locked in, right? You pretty much know he's going to be. Um, and you're going to make a little bit less money in the first 24 months. Not to say you can't sell more stud fees, but I'm just we're talking about apples to apples. Uh, 24 months of production, right? Uh, so on this mail, you got 24 months of production, 24 months of holding cost. On this mail, you have 24 months of production, 36 months of holding cost. And you'll see that investing in that earlier puppy is more profitable, right? However, you're going to have to sit on the sidelines for a year. So uh, with that said, I've covered expenses, i covered the cost, I've covered uh, realistic sales, right, of um, what you can garner. And so if you look at uh, these studs here, let's go here, Smash was um, a dog purchased in the UK and then repurchased back to come to the US, you know, $8,000 good stud fee reasonable stud fee for a good quality quality dog right and this might be dated guys i don't know i don't own smash um number one let me just say this i don't own any of these males and i don't make money off mentioning them um, i have not talked to their owners or their yards about mentioning them however they're open to the public right so it's free game for me to speak about them plus i like him and i'm a fan so i don't own smash again but his $8,000 fee is very reasonable. You got Morpheus, $30,000, right? Um, for a person with my budget, maybe not as reasonable, right? Uh, but that's not to say that that's not his value. Who am I to put a value on him, right? Based on his productions, what he does, what he creates, look, that number is there for a reason. So, again... To each their own. I'm just noting it to show you guys what people charge for stud fees that are online that anyone can go and Google and look up these dogs and see these stud fees. These images are not fabricated, right? They're there. They're there for the public to see if you have interest. And you got Mr. Klaus who, you know, again, one of my favorites as well. Beautiful dog. There, his stud fee is $10,000 off the website, right? And I got um, two girls off of him. And actually, <laughs> we're using him on our production. Let me show you that real quick. Hold on. So I am, here you go. 
So you saw his stud fee, right? And you saw what an adult dog costs. Well, here we go. Announcements, 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 right? I'm using Mr. Klaus to my girl that I imported from Brazil, Fortuna. So if you know what it costs to bring an adult dog here, you pretty much understand what I have invested into this breeding and to our program um, initially so that we can get off on the right foot and, and really um, bring a lot of substance and value to the industry. So I purchased an adult girl. If you watch my further videos, you know what it costs. Generally speaking, right? I'm not going to disclose numbers out of respect for the sellers and transporters and everyone else. So, here you go. Back to the episode, all right? Now you got Jumanji of Bossy Kennels. Beautiful dog. I have not seen this dog. I'd love to see this dog. Seriously. Look at her rear on this boy. Just a beautiful, beautiful dog. So, I'm looking forward to seeing him. Um... Oh, my goals of seeing him are sometime this year. Honestly. Sometime this year I'd like to see him. And go from there, really. But, uh, yeah. There he is, right? Just uh, the crop picture without the stud fees and stuff. Look at the rear on that boy. Short bite, look at the head on him. Very beautiful, amazing, amazing, beautiful dog. So, anyhow. Uh, we will exit the classroom, and in summary is this, right? No matter where you go or where you start, um, you know, ultimately, starting with a puppy male, there is a little bit of risk, right? Just because if the male doesn't turn out how you want, then you will garner less in terms of his revenue if any at all, right? So let's say that you picked up a puppy and you just got the worst luck ever and that puppy went all the way south. Well, um, I, I guess that's the end of it for that, right? You're gonna have to put them in the B market and hopefully you can recover your cost. That's the worst case scenario. Um, however, it is a lower price of admission to get in to get started. Now, if you're going to money up twenty, thirty, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars, um, then you know what you're getting, right? Now, just because you know what you're getting does not mean you're going to be able to sell stud fees. You know, there's two parts to this, guys. One part of it is your responsibility as a breeder to pick the correct asset or male in this instance that we're talking about to add to your program or to your yard and for the rest of other breeders to enjoy and incorporate uh, the second part is your job as a breeder to manage your male's breeding career correctly so if you got a fire male with a low coi and you keep taking them to girls with a high coi that don't exactly um, complement his structure what are people going to say? They're going to say, man, he's not a producer. He throws lanky dogs. He, you know, he doesn't throw his look. He doesn't produce. But if you have a male with like, let's say a 15% koi, beautiful male, but you're taking them to females that are 20, 25, 30% koi, then chances are, you know, unless he's really throws his look strong, the female dominates the litter and mind you that the female passes two X's on um, the genetic coding and the male only throws an X Y. The Y only carries the sex of the dog. So can you really look at a, a male and say, man, his productions are not so good and criticize, you know, the dog? Um, I think that falls more on us in, you know, money and uh, revenue is one thing but also understanding like controlling the narrative of what we're doing because again if the male has a low koi taking her to a high koi female that's line bred and he's an outcross what are you expecting right 
and then if the puppies don't turn out well, it looks bad on, you know, it reflects bad on his production, which reflects bad on you as the person managing his career. You understand there's like a lot of layers and dimensions here to talk about and probably a lot that most people don't even think about. So my thing is that every dog has goods and bads and has positive contributions. It's up to us to allow them to shine correctly, to really um, showcase what they can bring and contribute but if we don't do the dog right then the dog ends up looking like he's not a producer or he's you know whatever you know all those things in our industry where it's like yeah i don't want to use them or no one wants to use them now so ultimately guys that is my conclusion for this episode a, a lot to cover because there's so many levels when it comes to males. So males, okay, males are the most sought after and also the most scrutinized for the breed. Honestly, like you look at a male, male stud, they are scrutinized from how they look to their posture to their correctness to everything, what they color, the substance, and their productions. I mean... Males are just, they're put on that pedestal, but they're also nailed to the cross, if you know what I mean. So with that said, guys, um, let's give the males a break, right? It's, it's not their fault. Um, if anything, it would be our fault as a breeder to not properly screen these breedings correctly so that our males can contribute properly and positively for other breeders and aspiring breeders so that they can shine and not just turn a dollar and they have a bad production uh your dog loses you lose the person who used your dog loses it's, it's just a miss for everybody so a lot of moving parts here uh with that said guys earl at sumo bully kennels uh back at you with another one please like and subscribe thank you so much for watching uh, i enjoy this episode a lot because it this episode really means a lot to me um, without further ado, um, we got some exciting stuff coming up. Uh, we'll be announcing in the next uh, two, three episodes. So stay tuned, guys. All right. Peace. Good night.